The following interview was, was conducted with Ratio Cumberbatch, student representative of the Board of Trustees 2005 to 2007, and currently enrolled in the School of Vet Medicine at Purdue University for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Friday, March 26, 2010, in Stewart Center. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Welcome, Rachel, and good afternoon to you. Thank you. Okay, tell us a little bit about where you were born and parents and early years. I was born mm -hmm. in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I am the oldest of seven. My, my mother has four other children. My father has two. My, uh, my early years, um, my father is an immigrant from Trinidad. I uh, came over to the States to run for the University of Wisconsin Oshkosh, um, which is hilarious because I'm slower than molasses. So um, didn't get those genes at all. My mother was also enrolled. Was he a, stu was he a student there? Is that he, how he, he was a student. That's how he met my mother, actually. Okay. was a student athlete um, majoring in uh, information technology. Um, my mother was there. She's a Wisconsin native, um, and she was there studying as, as well. Um, my, my parents are really kind of huge influences in, in my life. My father's parents from Trinidad never graduated high school. So the fact that I am now going to be graduating a doctor in veterinary medicine um, is something that he's hugely proud of, and education's been really driven by my, my parents. So that, I think, is where the, the interest spanned from. Um, grew up all over Wisconsin. Um, significant. Did you, move, did you move around a little bit? Or Very much up? so. My, my parents are unfortunately divorced, but uh, both happily remarried. We moved around a lot when I was younger, which is important because it introduces you to new people and you and get adapt and adjust exactly adapt and adjust and get very comfortable uh, in your own skin just because uh, you and, and your, your family are really kind of the most constant thing that you have when you move around um, and new people coming in and out of my life is, is certainly something that I, I enjoy today lived a uh, amount of time in northern Wisconsin up near Green Bay before my uh, my stepfather uh, Paul took a job down in Indiana, and that is what brought us to Indiana when I was around 12 years old. Went to high school at Lebanon High School in Lebanon, in Lebanon Indiana, okay. central Indiana, about 40 minutes away from Purdue, and Purdue for college was obviously a, uh, a natural choice once I Tell was down here. Tell us about high school. What sort of activities were you involved in? As many as I could be. Uh, I was extremely involved. I was extremely was involved. It a, was it a large, is your class a large class? We had a class of about 290, which is a, a sizable class. I was uh, raised in the parochial school systems before high school, so that was a huge class uh, oh, yeah. for me, but compared to some of the high schools in Indiana, it was, uh, was of moderate size. I was a volleyball player, um, which took up majority of my time. Um, what did you do? We were... Not at the top of our brackets. That's okay. That's okay. It's but the fun in the, in the camaraderie. It's, it's the fun. It is the camaraderie. It's important. It's the competitiveness and, and the continual drive and really kind of pushing yourself against your own benchmarks, I think, is important. Um, competitive the entire way, way through. I was also involved in 4-H for 10-plus years, and that activity spanned my time in Wisconsin and my time in Indiana. It's I was, a good organization. It's a, a fabulous organization. Right. Yes, uh, my first introduction to my animal science professors were actually when I was 13, coming to coming some to of the yeah, Purdue okay. events through 4-H, and we uh, continue to be friends today. Um, so that is exciting. And my last very big activity in high school was called Youth as Resources, which is a United Way program. It essentially offers grants to student-run projects for community development. That was my first opportunity to sit on a board, and that's when I was 16 to 18 years old, um, and I absolutely loved it. So we probably should have been expecting me to go for an opportunity like Board of Trustees because I, I loved um, what exactly the boardroom. Tell us for the research, what sort of a arrangement was or what did you do? What, what was the, the organization? What, uh, With the Youth projects? as Resources? Yeah. Youth as Resources is a, uh, a small effort through the United Way. It is a board of students um, overseen by United Way faculty and then as well as adult community volunteers that also serve on this board. And what they do is take grants from written by students uh, for student projects and they are awarded based on the decision 
of, uh, of the board, students and, and adults. I first learned of the organization by submitting a grant myself, which effectively put green reflective address signs on all the uh, driveway homes of homes in Perry Township, which is a township in Lebanon, Indiana. The purpose for that was because it's difficult for emergency vehicles to find rural houses in, in Indiana in the case of emergency. So we were very strongly supported by our volunteer fire department and our hospital. And so I've always liked this, this team effort, and Super. my parents have been hugely involved in this the, the entire way through. Um, and so that was really an introduction to boards, introduction to teamwork, introductions to uh, finding a problem and devising solutions and then finding and ways to execute. And working with it through it, yeah. Exactly. Uh, and then did you, uh, any other schools that you thought about, or did, was Purdue kind of your top choice? You know, by the time that I hit my senior year, um, I was uh, already well-versed in the finances of college. My parents let me know that I would be paying for my own education so that I appreciated um, the investment. And lucky for me, uh, I was fortunate enough to acquire some scholarships. Um, and Purdue, one, had a fantastic program in science and agriculture, so it was a great selection in that. Um, tuition is it's a great value for an in-state student to come here to Purdue. And I already had a... Uh, a strong, a strong network just because of the 4-H involvement. Um, grad school was a different question. I, I did search for, for grad school a lot more, but applied to Indiana University, applied to Purdue University, got into both of those, and um, Purdue was my number one the entire time. Yeah. Tell us a little about your major thing, and then we'll talk about the board. But are, are you doing graduate work in the vet school? You already have your undergraduate degree? I do have my oh, undergraduate degree. Okay. My undergraduate degree is in agriculture the Department of Animal Sciences. I have two minors, a minor in, in biology and a minor in international studies and agriculture. I will have gone to school here a total of eight years by the time that I earned my degree in veterinary medicine. Um, it's a different life between undergraduates and, and graduate. Veterinary and it's school, a professional school. It too. is a professional school. Right. Yes. Um, veterinary school is just like medical school in the way that you need to do your undergraduate study before applying. Veterinary school is four years long, and I am studying mixed animals, so I study all domestic species, and I'm going into a career in public health. Very good. Do you want to think you might work for a government agency? Is that what you're thinking for public health? You know, there's a huge amount of, of options as far as veterinary medicine, and it's one of the strengths in the degree is that it offers you a great deal of latitude and gives you some strong fundamental knowledge. Um, government is definitely one area that employs veterinarians, as does nonprofits. The uh, new drive is for a one health effort, meaning that uh, anyone in the health professions, MDs, DVMs, um, pharmacists, uh, your PhDs, those that, that study the technical aspects, all work together in interdisciplinary teams. Um, government's at the forefront, industry is really pushing that. Um, nonprofit organizations are also um, a big player in this too, but essentially our goal is the same. It's going to be to improve the health of humans, um, and I will be dealing with the animal side of that. That's very good. Do you, do you want a small animal? Is that what you're, a mixed animal? Is that what I will be. I will be a lot more in the large animal, and that's really because of their food significance. Um, it ties a lot of it. The animal science side. The it does tie to the animal right. science side. Yes, the, the small animals definitely do as well. The large animal, as far as their international significance, um, and a lot of your emerging diseases are going to come in the developing world, and the large animals are really um, your community support sure. in those areas, and so that's what led me to large animal medicine. Um, but you certainly cannot underlook the impact of your small animals. Um, your, your rabies and other diseases and parasitic diseases certainly are harbored in those, those animals as well. And growing up in Lebanon in the country, you can bet that I had a, a, a small farm and animal family the entire time growing up. Some just move in. Right? Some just move in. They just come. Exactly. And they exactly. And, and they're, they're welcomed. Um, <laughs> and uh, some of those animals have lived at the house longer than I have. So it's their home. 
I had a cat, unfortunately, got a cancer and passed away some time ago, but it was dropped off on a friend's farm. Mm -hmm. But the cat was very smart because it just stayed in the barn until we'd come out and feed it, and then we thought, well, it's sort of cute, and take it home, and it worked out. It Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> they are, they're smarter than people give them credit for many times. <laughs> well, you can, they can understand. And, of course, with a cat, as soon as they know how to use the can opener, you're no longer needed. <laughs> <laughs> oh. What year are you in in the bed? When will you finish? I will be finished in May of 2011, so okay. I'm currently at the end of my third year. Good. So seventh year here at Purdue. Um, and we are just about six weeks away from going into clinical rotations. That's very good. What have you done during the summers? Did you, were you here during the summer? Or during, the summers, um, during the summers, during the summers, I one? use it as a time for internship and a really kind of fill in areas that the curriculum does not cover. Um, that is really kind of one way that I've allowed myself to, to stand out differently than other students. Um, it's been my philosophy throughout undergraduate as well. I like to travel internationally at least once a year and have been able to do that uh, throughout graduate school. I will unfortunately not have a summer this year. It's 12 months of clinical rotations. But throughout the summer, I, I do internships. I, I travel um, Relax, although sometimes my idea of relaxing is different than, than some people's, but definitely busy throughout those 11 weeks that we have. Where have you gone in, um, during your internships? Can you share? I, I can. Um, I have worked in graduate school two years for FSIS, which is the Food Safety and Inspection Service, part of the USDA for the government. Um, in undergrad, I worked with Elanco, which is Eli Lilly's animal pharmaceutical sector. I also interned with a Kentucky Equine Research, nutritional research um, organization in Versailles, Kentucky, um, as well as uh, doing multiple other travel and study abroads, if you will, which have given me um, perhaps equal and not more educational opportunities than my, my book it curriculum. It broadens your scope. It does, and it has been absolutely vital to everything else that I have done. Sounds very good. Let's, uh, let's talk about uh, your time on the board. Um, for the researchers, the selection process. Can you tell us a little about that and then orientation? and Absolutely. Yeah. So the, uh, the student is a uh, fully vested member in the Board of Trustees, which means that you have full voting rights of the other uh, nine adult members, if you will. Uh, the selection process is by a committee of students, staff, and faculty. Um, of the university. It is headed up by the uh, student government office here on campus. The way that the selection process went for me is a paper application um, with multiple essays where you really present what you can bring to the table, your, your desire uh, to be a trustee, and then a look at an issue that you, that you choose. Um, essentially, their way to see how you can format an argument if you were to present something to the board. After that, you go in front of an in interview with uh, that board, um, and with interviewing board in front trustees? of your no, the interview in front of the selection committee. It's interesting going in front of your peers because uh, we've we've worked together um, often. I was interviewing and going through this process as a sophomore at at this point, and they nominate names people that they would like um, in the position. Those names go to the governor, and then you are ultimately oh, a, the board a, a gubernatorial appointee. Um, all, mm -hmm. all ten members are eventually approved or appointed by, by the governor, even the alumni members. So it's a long process. It's a very new process to me. I was in the first uh, batch of appointees from Governor Mitch Daniels when he was uh, first elected into office. Were there other candidates that also were interviewed by him before he makes a selection? Or is there, or is there just... From the student that? standpoint, uh -huh. there, there are. They, um, by law, you can put forward ten names. Okay. Um, and I believe that there were three to four on the year um, put forth um, and narrowed down from that selection committee that the committee felt they would be happy with um, serving as, as their voice and voting on their conviction um, on the board of trustees. Um, and they were all very strong candidates. Um, and it's, it's always a really a, a tough process. Um, and is it, you eventually it know. Is it a long time? Normally starts around February. Okay. The process does. And I heard of my appointment in late July. How so it's quite you? a lengthy process. Phone call. I was interning in Versailles, Kentucky at that time and got the call from one of the staff members at uh, Governor Daniel's office. And I'm not sure if words can really explain what goes through your, your mind. 
Um, but my parents were my first phone call after I, I heard the news to that. So my father actually was my, my first phone call. He's always uh, had a interest and love in, in politics. Um, and so he was just absolutely elated and um, mom wasn't too far behind that as far as the phone call either. So <laughs> they were both thrilled. That's good. How about you know, an orientation? What sort of process do they have for orientation? for the uh, for Orientation for the Board of Trustees is kind of a baptism by fire. Um, we like to explain it as drinking out of a fire hose. Um, for any member coming out of the Board of Trustees, and especially the student, it's a very steep learning curve. My first um, interaction with the board was at our fall retreat which is a closed door session where the trustees discuss issues of the upcoming year. Um, and it's very good first meeting and orientation, a chance to get to meet your fellow board members um, without the public eye, and a chance to really discuss um, personnel and, and financial and physical facilities issues as well as begin to forecast some of the challenges for that year. Um, you are, I guess, introduced to issues before that through a very large amount of, of reading and material that the administration is very happy to provide you following up to that meeting. And it's, uh, it takes about a year before you're even comfortable. I mean, every single board meeting was, was a learning experience and I never pass up an opportunity to spend time with the trustees, whether we were traveling or we were fundraising or we were uh, opening new buildings. Right. I mean, it definitely, everything's an orientation process, but that first fall retreat is really is your first introduction. Is it for a weekend? Or it is an all-day event. It is held at Westwood. Um, Dr. Martin Jiski was president while I was on the board. Um, and so, really, he led the meeting uh, to introduce the new trustees and then to well, bring everyone up to speed. There were coming out at the same time? There were. I came on when Bill Osterley and Tom Spurgeon were first appointed to the board. Okay. Interesting. Coming in together. There, yes. Right. Okay. What uh, were some of the challenges that... Uh, you think you faced or some of the goals or responsibilities as being on the board? Uh, from a student standpoint, I think that really one of your first challenges is understanding your responsibility to all the constituents um, of the state and not just the students. Uh, we serve as a very good sentinel for the opinions on campus. Um, we certainly live and understand the pressures put on by the decisions made by the trustees and the administration. Um, and so you are not only the voice of the students, but also the staff and the faculty and the community members and, and voters of, of Indiana and those in the legislature. And that's a lot to wrap your head around. As, as a student um, who may not have had introductions to many of these uh, different parties. And then for me coming in, I was a previous uh, president's leadership class member and sophomore advisor and really looking at programs and analyzing and trying to see problems um, and working through this, it was an interesting learning curve to critique the programs of your mentor. And so for me, that was an interesting situation. All right. We, the president of leadership class, Dr. Chesky's class, you remember that? I was. Right. You are brought in as a freshman, mm -hmm. um, welcome to apply based on your admission application. Um, and I was one of the lucky 30 students to come in, into that class, and then was, was one of the uh, very fortunate three to be able to continue for a year as a sophomore advisor. They do have some continue, just not everybody in the class continues on. Correct. Three, okay. um, three out of the 30 are asked to come back and you serve as a mentor to the incoming freshmen. Oh, that's, that's very, and that's great experience. It's fabulous experience. Okay. That was the first introduction I had to university leadership and administration. Um, and I was obviously extremely inspired and um, a very impressed. A lot of learning then. Were there some committees that you served on when you were on the board? There when were. Okay. Uh, you are on two of four committees. The committees that I served on were physical facilities and academic affairs committee. Do they, do they put you on the committee or do you have, a, uh, an op does it have an option to be on it? They try to pair you up with where your, uh, your expertise and your experience sure. will allow the greatest impact. And it, those two committees are very natural spots for the students because uh, we are impacted by the decisions of, of both of those. Um, and so I uh, told them kind of my background and then Tim McGinley who was chairman of the board has the, uh, the final selection of, of where um, you are nominated or where you are put to. Right. Okay. And I served on those committees for, for two years. And then, of course, during that time, the, there was a presidential search. There was. Uh, that is a very in, unique in, experience. Yes. I can, 
you you'll think about that years ahead. It was a great experience. For Absolutely, you. and it's a very long um, process and one that uh, has a lot of input from many different parties. Um, and oh, there yeah. is a great deal of, of thought and effort and time that goes into that. Um, and so you begin really by assessing where you currently are, what the strengths of Purdue is, um, how the uh, strategic plan, um, and where exactly that puts us. Um, and so you are both, I guess, selling Purdue um, to a potential candidate, as well as trying to find the correct candidate um, and able to, in, yeah. to fit into where you're going in the vision of the university. So we, we started that process almost when I began on the board. So it was essentially a, uh, a year and a half to two year process. That's a lot. Well, sometimes people don't realize, it. Men, people I've interviewed, that is the, the selection of the president is the most important. And even some of the trustees have said that to me, that, and, and that's right. Selection of the, of the president is really one of the key, most important things. Oh, absolutely. I, I agree. I agree wholeheartedly. I mean, the Board of Trustees really is the vision, um, but it's the president that is, uh, is holding those reins and is materializing that, and they are an incredibly crucial and really kind of the link that keeps everybody else, else here. So it's important that you have strong leadership and... Uh, I consider myself extremely fortunate to have been here um, when I was. One, because I got this process. Two, because I consider Dr. Jiski one of um, my great mentors that I've had the opportunity to work with. And we had an incredibly strong board who put in a lot of hours, which offered me a great deal of mentorship that I am very thankful for. And they generally have a love for Purdue. Um, so I can say that this was always a... Uh, a cordial process um, and watching how they interact with each other um, and how these leaders work together I pull on great that every day right there, right? yes exactly. great people great leadership I mean they represent um, the constituents extremely well and and ultimately they're people of high integrity that's just amazing to be around did you get a chance to meet any key people that when you're on the board that you as you look back on because I know someone told me when Neil Armstrong was here they got the person got a chance to meet <laughs> Yeah, I, uh, I, li I like to joke that I had the opportunity to spend time with the giants whose shoulders I stand upon. And it's true, I got to spend time with living legends. Um, and Neil Armstrong I've had the opportunity to meet a few times. Oh, how nice. Um, which is incredible. I got an opportunity to introduce my mother to him too, which may have been even more exciting than getting to meet him the first time is to allow my family to join in some of these activities. The board themselves are just uh, incredible people. And, and great to work with. Um, we also had quite a few speakers come in, so got to uh, give a hug and have a conversation with uh, Nobel Laureate Lech Walesa, um, which is incredible, and spend time with Colin Powell and, Powell and uh, Madeline Albright. And, and it just seems surreal for someone at age 20 and 21 right. to be having uh, opportunities like that. Oh. And inspiring people, um, and it's nice to see that inspiring people are inspired. I mean, they're grateful, they're appreciative, and it gives you a direction, no matter where you're going, uh, of how you can kind of lean your own path. Yeah, very good. Okay. Uh, let's talk a little about time management, I think, uh, and then we'll talk about leadership. You know, go ahead with that. Time management. That's a challenge, isn't Time it? management. Time management is always a challenge. <laughs> um, and but it's then again, you've been doing a lot in high school and college, so, you know, maybe, but I can always kind of sometimes mismanage. <laughs> sure, ab absolutely. Um, and how you really, uh, priority management and energy management, I think, is really the key to that. Um, Good point. There is certainly um, things that demand your time, but I also like to have a diverse schedule so that I could keep my energy up. And it really allowed me to put in a fairly, a fairly hectic work schedule and still really, really enjoy it the entire way through. Um, I was a full-time student. Um, sometimes that gets forgotten through this entire process and was applying to professional school at this time. So that uh, was number one as far as my priority was being a strong student. Um, being part of a, a presidential search on the Board of Trustees was uh, where I spent a great deal of time, but I enjoyed it and that was really an, an energy booster. I never once came back from a meeting or a trustee event and felt exhausted. If anything, I was overly energized and able to put in more hours because of it's that. It's amazing what that'll do for you. Isn't it, it does. When you think of when, when you look at it from its proper perspective. Yeah, right. I mean, energy management is that, and I had a great support system. 
the faculty at uh, in the animal science department was amazingly supportive, and that's great when your professors are excited. Um, I worked around a lot of tests, and uh, moved a lot of a lot of meetings, and did a lot of class reading on my own sometimes. But luckily, those professors were really willing to meet with me one on one, right. um, and that was entirely um, helpful uh, for my process. I. Uh, was also involved in an organization called the Timmy Foundation, which is a uh, nonprofit medical organization that mobilizes medical professionals and students and able to provide medical care to international countries. Right now we are in Ecuador and Guatemala. So in this time, I was also helping to lead a medical mission down to Ecuador. Um, and so trying to put all those in, we're uh, prioritizing. Um, but uh, along the way, you do you it. You better write your little bookmark and, and say that. <laughs> yes, my, uh, my mortar board is actually to this day part of my scrapbook because it's good to know exactly what I was doing on my day. Uh, I schedule down to the half hour and still do that today, actually. Um, but it's, uh, and it's it fantastic works. to see. It works, and I'm happy with it. And when I don't have that diverse schedule now, I really uh, get drained of energy. So the fact that you are surrounded by energetic people makes this entirely possible. Right. And you see that work every day. Very good. Leadership. And your thoughts on leaders' role in academia as well as the professional world? Leadership role. You know, academia and the professional world, this, this answer is probably going to be the same. It's to... Yeah. It's to and you've had some... I had great leaders. I, know, right? I have had some fantastic leaders, and I think that I will call them inspirational. Um, and each of them really challenge you, and I think they ultimately funnel that energy. One of the big things that I can see in each of the people that I had a chance to work with is they're just amazingly passionate and high energy, as well as high integrity. And I think that all of those are what drives leadership. Um, when those break down is when you start to see the foundation of organizations fail. And I was incredibly pleased and blessed to know that each one of uh, the members on the board had each of those strengths. Um, and it so resonates. It does. Absolutely uh, across the board it resonates. And there was amazing energy in the faculty at that point, uh, amazing energy in the students, and I think that's all of reflection by having a team having a well-branded and thought-out mission. Um, as far as a plan and everybody was excited about the direction and you are surrounded by very very talented people and the leadership is really just the one that uh, says go and gives a direction and allows people to to take chances and, and to make mistakes and most of the time uh, risks that were taken were really able to to pay off and to produce some pretty extraordinary stories good very good how about some hobbies any special interests are your hobbies? I've been telling you about my hobbies. <laughs> this is what this is what I do for fun. I know. Um, Anything special? Hobbies. I I love being surrounded by people, um, and so I really uh, take every chance to be surrounded by that. I enjoy teaching, and I think maybe being an older sister to six may have something to do with that. So how old is the youngest one? <laughs> it's, he is four. Um, so there's 20 years in between me Super. and my, my youngest brother. Um, and so teaching definitely um, is a passion and, and hobby of mine. I have also two horses at, at home, which are a great uh, energy release uh, when I have the, a chance to do that and really stress and, and uh, do that. But spending time with friends, cheering on Purdue, um, having a chance to work with these organizations, which again goes back to my, my energy management. Um, my hobbies are really things that increase my energy level. Um, and I just continue taking opportunities that are fun to me, that I am passionate about, and uh, ultimately help me grow. So my siblings do that, my friends do that, my family do that, my hobbies do that. Super, sounds good. Uh, do you have a favorite Purdue tradition? You know, we were we were trying hard. I asked my friends about this, uh -huh. uh, about my favorite Purdue tradition. And as funny of a tradition as it is, I think one of my favorites is senior court. Um, because it's a way to uh, kind of uh, capture what you've done in the past four years. I was a proud member of Iron Key and Mortarboard while I was here to organizations that uh, have some 
great tradition in them, and we all made senior chords. And uh, it's kind of a little-known, somewhat dying tradition that we're trying to keep alive. But every homecoming to break out those senior chords and to have alumni from age 80 to age 20 wearing their, their chords. And, they um, to, and they're so proud that they can fit into them. You know, that's one of my goals. If I, know I know. If I come back at 65 and can still fit into my senior chords, that is going to be a success, I think. Get an elastic waist and then you're okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I have the Griffin on my senior chords. I have the Timmy Foundation logo. Um, I have the, the countries that I've traveled on. I have uh, paw prints to represent my veterinary medicine. It's been a very fulfilling uh, four years, so it's very full chords. <laughs> That's very good. That's nice. Do you have an outstanding event? An outstanding year? event. Right. Um, my four me, years it, have been a little surreal. I would say my outstanding events were my international travels. While I was at Purdue, I had the opportunity to travel to Honduras for three months, travel to China for three weeks, and uh, go on two medical missions to Ecuador. And those each have a huge impact on me. Um, and Purdue is very much a part of those experiences, even uh, across large oceans and in different continents. Right. What did you do in the medical mission? Can you make a comment? What were some of the things? How long were you down? What were you doing? Down we there? planned for an entire year for mm -hmm. these brigades, and we are down in small barrios, our communities in Ecuador, for one week. And what we do is bring 20 students and 10 medical professionals and provide primary care for residents of these communities. So a lot of the wellness care, if they have a, a complaint or a health issue, we are carrying around 2,800 pounds of medicine and supplies with us to disseminate while we are there. And it is probably the best educational for pre-professionals to get. You are working right beside doctors while you are down there taking care of real patients. Um, and so Timmy Foundation is a way to mobilize resources and energy. Um, and it, again, is a very strong organization that I've had the benefit to be a part of. And it was that process of, of seeing goals and, and watching them materialize and putting together a team of 20 great students from here at Purdue. Good. Where's your next trip going to be? Do you have anything coming up soon or not? You know, I don't. I am now going to be going into clinical rotations, which means that uh, I will be, be on here on campus um, <laughs> for, the, for the next year. But uh, the sky's the limit. I love traveling. Um, I know, and, you, that and you get William, definitely. It, it's it's engaging, and you learn a lot from it. You do, which, which is really great. Um, and it's always an eye opener for students to see. Um, you hear a lot of stories, but when you go down there in the community, I have not had one student come back that hasn't been impacted. And what they normally say is that they have learned so much more from traveling than they were even able to teach, no matter what community you go in. Sure. And you can see the different in perspective from students that have traveled internationally, whether it be in a developed world or developing world, um, than those that have not had that opportunity. So I think that it is very much a part of education. It's a part of leadership and knowing the diversity and the different cultures and the connectedness of people everywhere uh, is vital. Right. And then post-Purdue, I was going to ask you that, but you got another year. And then Post-Purdue. Yeah. Right. <laughs> How did you happen? To, were you thinking of other graduate schools, or was the vet school or veterinary medicine of a special interest? I was. Um, I knew that I wanted to impact human health. Um, essentially, when I started traveling, I got introduced to a great amount of poverty, and I became very interested in community development, and that requires education, and that requires health care and that requires economic development um, and the one piece that could let that entire foundation really crumble is the lack of health care when when you're doing that and they really all feed into each other but health care is what grabbed me I took the MCAT so that medical school was still on the table um, but veterinary school and the impact to animals is where I thought I could have the most impact and as an animal science major it was definitely a, sure. a, a natural a natural uh, decision but I was admitted to University of, of Minnesota. I was also admitted to Wisconsin. And my decision came down to Wisconsin and, and Purdue. And I will say that it was not an immediate choice. I, I knew that I had had an amazing experience here at Purdue. I was a little concerned of my ability to step back from being in a trustee role to going back to being a student. And not only that, to be able to uh, say no when there are different opportunities, because I always want to be involved 
in, in Purdue activities. So time management, I was a little worried about um, with staying here. Sally Mason, who was serving as provost at the time, called me into her office and we, we talked. Um, and she is a scientist by trade as well. Sure. Right. So was an, a natural mentor um, and very impressive leader as, as well. And we had a newly appointed dean at this time, Dr. Uh, Willie Reed. Um, who became a, uh, a very quick friend and mentor. And so eventually the network and the opportunities that I have here at Purdue just outweighed anything else and really kind of overcame any challenges that I was afraid that I would, would fix. And uh, here I yeah. am, right? Yeah. And here I am, here I am. three years later. Yeah, anything that I, that I missed that you'd like to uh, make any comments or closing or something that I may have skipped? that you think about? I think of if I had one thing that I would have done differently as a student trustee would be to take the opportunity to really show my appreciation to those that I served with. Um, and that includes the, the students, that includes the community members that have been so involved, and especially involves uh, Dr. Jiski and, and the trustees. Uh, sometimes it's, uh, oh, it's sure difficult to portray that, and really there is some knowledge that you gain as you uh, get older. And, and you look back and there's uh, definitely appreciation there. And it gives you a lot of energy when you're going through graduate school and things that can be extremely daunting. It's acceptable to have mediocrity for yourself, but there's been so many people that have had an impact in my life that, I mean, you really want to grab that potential that they have cultivate right. and to really have an impact. And so um, the leadership that they have offered, the continual friendship and the support, has just been incredible. Um, the student trustee is definitely a great way for them to get the knowledge from campus and get the students impact, but that student comes out so, um, I guess, touched by the people that they've been allowed to work with that it is just an amazing opportunity. It's a great experience. It is and a great is. experience. And, and, you, and you benefit by it and, and you certainly listening to you really grasp by it and you benefit and they have too so it's a two-way street it, it's Good. been a it was an amazing four years um, as an undergraduate it was an incredible two years as a, a trustee um, and it has been a very interesting three years as a veterinary student so yeah. Purdue has been a great place for me super boiler up right boiler thank up. you Rachel very <laughs> much <laughs>